anyone. Don't be afraid. I mean, it's right there, beloved. This is Elishaba. Go ahead, Elishaba. Um, in Exodus 5 and 1, um, Yahweh said, well, in my Bible, he said, saith the Lord God of Israel. And he says, let my people go so they can hold a feast. But in 6, I'm sorry, in 7 and 16, 16 he says, uh, and thou shalt say unto him, the Lord God of the Hebrews, mm-hmm. and let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. Uh-huh. Okay. So one, he's saying he is the God of, the, of Israel, and the other, he's saying he's the God of the Hebrews, and in the first one, he's saying, let my people go so they may hold a feast for me. And in 16, he's saying, so they may serve me. Mm-hmm. Very good. Anyone else? All right. The first mention of a phrase like this is in Exodus 3 and 18. And let's read this as we walk through, because we're going to walk forward. The first time this is mentioned, it is done as a request. It reads, Somebody said, who said right? <laughs> it's Willie and Pensacola. Hallelujah. The first time, see, so until we do something like what they did nationally, the first time Israel appears to Pharaoh is through a humble request. You got to understand the pattern because the creator wants to get, the creator is going to get the glory for this. Not just here in Egypt, but here on these shores. And so if you understand how this was done, this is how it happened. It's done through a humble request first. Watch. Verse 18 of the third chapter says, Then they will heed your voice, and you shall come, you and the elders of Israel, to the king of Egypt. And you shall say to him, meaning Pharaoh, the Yah Elohecha, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now, please, see that word? Bevakasha, please let us go. That don't sound like no demand to me. Please let us go. Three days' journey into the wilderness. So, a day's journey is 20 miles. You multiply that times three. And Moses wanted to take them a simple 60 miles away, a three-day journey, look now, into the wilderness that we may sacrifice unto Yahweh our El, or Yahweh Eloheinu, okay? <clears throat> and if you continue, it's already known in the beginning. Question, is this? going to heed their humble request. Anyone? Now all y'all have got silent. <laughs> Is Pharaoh going to heed their, his, their request? No. no. Why? No. Because the next verse is not a trick question, but I want you to Look, I want y'all to understand something. None of this is set up to trick you or to embarrass anybody. My design, my desire, and how I was taught by the elders and the spirit of the Holy One of Israel that's upon me is not to trick. It's to get you to see what's there in the scripture so you can understand the larger picture as we get closer and closer to our exodus here. Verse 19 says, but I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not even by a mighty hand. That doesn't mean they weren't supposed to make the request. That didn't mean that they weren't supposed to demand. That means they weren't supposed to keep the heat on. That means they weren't supposed to cry out. They were supposed to do all them things. Because the more and more they did that, the more and more the creator would bring forth signs and wonders. Because Yah's objective was to lay his hand on a prideful and sinful, haughty, desperate.
spotlight nation and bring them down. That's what he wanted to do. The creator had a plan. So when you read this, you got to look. So, oh, the creator has a plan. This is a plan. So you move from Exodus 3, 18. You turn over to where Elishava was just mentioning. And it's Exodus 5, 1. And look what happens. This is after the events of verse 30 and 31 of the previous chapter. So I'm going to read it because prior to the Whittingham Bible in the 15th century, there were no verses to divide these narratives. So now we got verses in here to divide and number the narratives. So in narrative, verse 30 and 31, it says, And Aaron spoke all the words which Jehovah spoke, had spoken to Moses, and then he did the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed, and when they heard that Yahweh had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads to worship. Israel had to see signs. Israel wasn't going to just believe by some words. If you think anybody going to believe your words you're coming to them with, or when those in the end times speak before the President of the United States, the European Economic Community, the Hague, the UN, and if you think they're going to believe their words, no. Nor are your people going to believe the words. Y'all going to have to see some signs. Especially those who are unbelievers. And even when they saw the signs, if you understand our ancient historical past, we're talking about our people who saw 10 outstretched plagues. And we went 50 days out of Egypt, 50 days out of slavery, and Dathan, Abiram, and Korah talking about, let's go back to Egypt. And they had a bunch of people wanting to follow them back. And that's what the spirit of unbelief will do. So as you go back down into 5, continuing on, that they bowed their heads in worship, then it says, continuing now, the same thought. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said, Thus said Yahweh, Elohe Yisrael, let my people go that they may, that the word, may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh fires back. And you know who done read the book of Yasha when he brought out Janus and Jambres and others and they went to look through the books of the scrolls of Egypt or Kemet, Mitzrayim. They couldn't find the name of Yahweh in their book. So then Pharaoh says, hmm, who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh, know why I let Israel go. They said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please, there that word is again, let us go three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto Yahael, unless he fall upon us with a pestilence or with the sword. And then, verse 4, very critical. Then king, the king of Egypt said unto them, why do you take the people away from their avodah, work, that can also be translated into slavery, why do you take their people away from their slavery or their servitude? Get back to your labor. Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor? Mm -mm. Turn the page. Go over to chapter 7, and you read that in verse 16. As we're getting ready to go into verse 8, because that's where we're getting ready to go, you know the first plague is the plague of blood on the waters. And not just any old stream. It ain't no lake. It is the most precious waterway in the world at that time, and that was the River Nile. It was turned completely to blood. And everything in it died. And then Yah had Moses and Aaron say, The God of the Hebrews has sent me to you, saying, Let my people go. 
that they would serve me in the wilderness. But indeed until now, he would not hear them. Now we go in to the eighth chapter. Make note. If somebody got some feedback going on, make note that this was occurred for a period of seven days. Chapter 8, verse 1 says, And Yahweh spoke unto Moses, Go to Pharaoh and say to him, Thus saith Yahweh, Let my people go that they may serve me. And it phrases again. You may want to write this down how many times it starts to appear, because it's not the last time. It's not the first time. It's not the last time. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all your territory with frogs. That's the second plague. So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come unto your houses and into your bedrooms and on your bed, into your houses of your servants, on your people, into your ovens, into your kneading bowls. And the frogs shall come upon you and your people and all your servants. Then Yahweh spoke unto Moses, say unto Aharon, Stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, fresh water, you need to circle that, over the rivers and over the ponds and cause the frogs to come up on the land of Egypt. And Aharon stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs on the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aharon and said, Entreat Yahweh that he may take away the frogs from me and my people, and I will let the people go. You may want to circle that. That they may sacrifice unto Yah. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Accept the honor of saying, when I shall intercede for you, for your servants, and for your people, to destroy the frogs from you and your house, that they may remain in the river only. So he said, tomorrow. And he said, okay, let it be according to your word, that you may know that there is no one like Yahweh our mighty one. And the frogs shall depart from you, from your house, from your servants, and from your people. They shall only remain in the river. Now you may want to put in your footnote, by verse 12, the frogs are going to be destroyed. So you watch the sequence of events. Verse 12 reads on this wise. And it says, then Moshe and Aharon went out from Pharaoh, and Moshe cried, Moshe cried, Moshe cried unto Yahweh concerning the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh. So Yahweh did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses and out of the courtyards and out of the fields. And they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. So right in your margin, they piled up dead flesh, decaying flesh. They piled it up. Because I want to show you, as you read through this, the sequence of events of how the divine hand of the Most High was in this from the beginning, from the first time the staff was thrown down and became a serpent and consumed all of their staffs. Abba Yah was in it right from the beginning. It reads on this wise, the next verse, which is verse 15. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart, and he did not heed them as Yahweh said. Third plague, lice. Verse 16. And so Yahweh said unto Moshe, say unto Aharon, stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land, so that it may become like lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so. For Aharon stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth, and it became lice on man 
and on beasts, and all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Now the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. But they could not. Now you need to circle that. We are in Exodus chapter 8, verse 18, where the magicians of Kemet tried to work the miracle with their enchantments to bring forth life. And I want you to know that life, even they're a detestable, are living beings, are living creatures. So it's very important, very important you understand what just happened here. They could not. So the lice were on man and beast. I'm going to say that again. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of Yah. But Pharaoh's heart grew harder, and he did not heed them as Yahweh has said. Question, just give me the number. How many plagues are we into right now? Four. Have we gotten to the fourth one, or are we going to the fourth one? Three. Three. Okay. So we're going to recap just by enumerating the plagues, right? So the first plague is blood. The second plague is the frogs. The frogs die. They're put into a heap. The third plague is lice. The third plague is lice. When we start verse 20, we're going into the fourth plague. Now watch the sequence of events. The water poison, the, the blood in the water of the rivers of Egypt poisons the water. Everything in the river comes out of it, or rather everything in the river dies. The frogs, amphibious creatures, come out of the water. The frogs die, they decay. The next thing that comes out of the decay through a miracle is lice. Something then comes after the lice. Verse 20. So Yahweh said unto Moses, rise in the morning, stand before Pharaoh, and as he comes out to the water, say to him, thus saith Yahweh. Notice he didn't say, thus saith Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews or the God of Israel. He simply said, thus saith Yahweh, let my people go that they might serve me. Or else, if you do not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and on your servants, on your people, into your house. The houses of the Egyptians will be full of flies and also the ground on which they stand. And in that day, I will Kodesh. Kodesh. I will set apart the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there, in order that you may know that I am Yahweh in the midst of the land. The Most High makes a separation between his people and the Egyptians. And there's a difference. Continuing, it says, verse 23, I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow, this sign shall be. There's that word again, another sign. So, I want you to understand that when Moses' hand was turned, right, from the hand of a natural Israelite man, meaning melanated, black, his hand was turned from black to leprous like snow, that was a sign. That was a miracle. Moses took his hand, put it back into his bosom, and it was restored to his other flesh. Another sign was the staff being turned from a staff into a serpent. And though the Egyptian magicians mimic it, it was Aaron's staff that swallowed their staffs. The other sign was the water in the river being turned to blood. And another sign behind that were the frogs coming out of the water, getting into people's houses. So numerous were they, according to this scripture, they were in the ovens. So they were pestilence. And then when they died, 
The next plague, which was a sign, was lice. Oat, oat, sign, oat, omen, a sign, a beacon, a mark. It's trying to show you something. When you drive down the interstate and you see a green sign and it has one quarter of a mile, next one quarter of a mile, exit Kedzi, or next one quarter of a mile, exit Cicero, you know by the sign giving you information where you should get off at if Cicero or Kedzi is your next exit. If you don't pay attention to the sign, you're going to miss it. Blue signs with white letters are what we call informational signs for hospitals, rest stops, and if you've been driving for a long distance and you're looking for a rest area so you can get off and take care of something in nature, if you don't pay attention to the sign, you miss the rest area, you might have an accident. And I don't mean just one with the car, I mean one in the car. Pay attention to the, somebody chuckling, pay attention to the sign, beloved. You're seeing the signs. If you saw, and we were in Egypt 3,600 years ago, and you saw the Nile River turn blood red, you know what? It's a sign, right? Somebody help me out. Is that right? Okay. Yes, sir. So, so if you see that, in 2015, in 2014, 2011, in 2010, in 2009, all you got to do is Google it on YouTube and you will see the Yellow River, the Yangtze River, the Amazon River all turn blood red. That's a sign. Rivers in Texas turn blood red. That's a sign. You don't think it's a sign when you see 10,000 beluga whales wash up on the shore? That's a sign. You don't think it's a sign when you see dolphins, 250,000 tons of fish wash up on the ocean seashore? That's a sign. The ecosystem has been disturbed. The entire Ecological balance has been imbalanced. In fact, one of the plagues at the end time, the Creator says that He will strike all the men and women who have the mark of the beast on them with boils. That was a plague of Egypt. Somebody got to be hearing what I'm saying. You are looking at the same series of events occurring. Very profound. Very, very profound. Verse 24 says, and continuing, that Yahweh did so, and the thick swarms of flies came into the houses of Pharaoh's and into his servants' houses and into all the land of Egypt, that the land was corrupted because of the swarm of flies. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, go sacrifice unto Yahweh in our God in the land. And Moses said, watch now, it is not right for us to do so, for we will be sacrificing the abomination of the Egyptians to Yahweh our El. If we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, then they will not stone us? What was the abomination unto the Egyptians? And if you don't know, you better go back and read what we read in Genesis chapter 46, 34. We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice unto Yahweh El as he commanded us. See, the Egyptians worshipped a pagan deity called Apis, which was a calf god. And that was sacred to them. And quiet as it's kept, the Israelites don't remember. We ate bullock, and we ate calf, and we ate, you know, what you call beef at that time. And if the Egyptians had saw us sacrifice animals, certainly we ate ram and lamb. If the Egyptians had saw us sacrificing that within their confines, they would have killed us outright because that was sacrificing the image and the, the actual literal manifestation of a pagan deity, which was a power or a god to them. We weren't going to do that. Moses was way wiser than that. 
He asked again, let us go out into the journey of the wilderness three days and sacrifice unto Yah, I am, as he commanded us. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice unto Yahweh your El in the wilderness. Only, you know, you shall not go very far and intercede for me. And then Moses said, Indeed, I am going out from you, and I will entreat Yahweh that the swarm of the flies may depart tomorrow from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people. But let not Pharaoh deal deceitfully anymore in not letting the people go to sacrifice unto Yah. So I'm going to continue reading this through 9, and we'll get to 10 and stop and have this discussion real quick. And so Moses went from Pharaoh and entreated Yah. And Yahweh did according to the word of Moses. He removed the flies from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people. Not one remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart. And at this time, also, neither would he let the people go. That is the end of the reading of chapter 8, verse 1 to verse 32. May Yahweh add clarity, enlightenment, and edification to the reading of his word. Let's go on through chapter 9, and we'll stop, and we'll go back and do chapter 10 before we close. Reads on this wise. We're going now into the fifth plague, dealing with the livestock stricken. It reads on this wise. Then Yahweh said unto Moses, Go into Pharaoh and tell him, Thus saith Yahweh, the ale of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go, and still hold them, behold, the hand of Yahweh will be on your cattle, in your fields, on your horses, on the donkeys, on your camels, on the oxen, and on every sheep. A very severe pestilence. Pestilence. And Yahweh will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, so that nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. Then Yahweh appointed a set time. I know you there, Ima. I know you there. And Yahweh appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow Yahweh will do this thing in the land. So Yahweh did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died. But the livestock of the children of Israel, hmm, not one, was dead. Not one died. Then Pharaoh sent, and indeed, not even one of the livestock of the Israelites was dead, but the heart of Pharaoh became hard, and he did not let the people go. So, Yahweh said unto Moses and Aharon, take for yourselves handful of ashes from a furnace, and let Moses scatter them towards the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh. And it will become fine dust in all the land of Egypt, and it will cause boils that break out into sores on man and on beasts throughout all the lands of Egypt. And then they took ashes from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moshe scattered them towards the heavens, and they caused boils that break out into sores on man and beast. And the Egyptians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. For the boils were on the magicians and on, on all the Egyptians. But Yahweh hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not heed them, just as Moses, strike that, just as Yahweh had said unto Moses. So now we go back and we look at the fifth plague, which is the livestock, from verse 1 through verse 7. Then the sixth plague that deals with the boils affecting man. From verse 8, we read to verse 12. Now you want to write down plague number 7. Chapter 8, verse 13. Then Yahweh said unto Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh, and say to him, Thus saith Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For at this time I will send all my plagues to your very heart and on your servants and on your people, that you may know that there is none likened unto me in all the earth. Now, if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, 
then you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed for this purpose have I raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name may be declared to the ends of all the earth. And as yet, you exalt yourself against my people, in that you will not let them go. Behold, tomorrow, about this time, I will cause a very heavy hail to rain down, such as has not been in Egypt since its founding until now. And therefore, send now and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field, for the hail shall come down on every man and on every animal which is found in the field and which is not brought home, and they shall die. I'm going to circle that too. And he who feared, he who respected the word of Yahweh among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. Note that. But he who did not regard the word of Yahweh left his service and his livestock in the field. Then Yahweh said unto Moses, Stretch out your hand towards the heaven, that there may be hail on all the land of Egypt, and on all of man, on all man and beast, in every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his rod towards the heaven, and Yahweh sent thunder and hail and fire darting to the ground. And Yahweh rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mixed with hail, so very heavy that there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. And then Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aharon and said to them, I have sinned this time, and Yahweh is righteous, and my people and I are wicked. Entreat Yahweh that there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, for it is enough. I will let you go and you shall stay no longer. And Moses said unto him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands unto Yahweh, and the thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, that you may know that the earth is Yahweh's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you will not yet fear Yahweh. Now the flax and the barley were struck, for the barley was in the head and the flax in the bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not struck, for they are late crops. Verse 31 and 32 are very important. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread out his hands to Yahweh, and then the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain was not poured upon the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more again, and he hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and neither would he let the children of Israel go, as Yahweh has spoken unto Moses. That is the reading of Exodus chapter 9, verse 1 through 35. May Yahweh add clarity and enlightenment and edification to the reading of his word. Just a few more minutes. Bear with me. We're going to go ahead and look at chapter 10, verse 1 through 29, and we'll come back. We've got plenty of time to review, so let's just walk through this. And it reads on this wise. And now Yahweh said unto Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him. Circle the word sign. And that you may tell in the hearing of your sons and your sons' sons the mighty things that I have done in Egypt and my signs which I have done among them, and that you may know that I am Yahweh. So Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and said to him, 
Thus saith Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. Or else, if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory, and they shall cover the face of the earth so that no one will be able to see the earth, and they shall eat the residue of what is left, which remains to you from the hail, and that they shall eat every tree which grows up for you out of the field. And they shall fill your houses and the houses of your servants and the houses of all the Egyptians, which neither your fathers nor your father's fathers have or father's fathers have seen since the day that they were on the earth to this day. And he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh's servants said unto him, How long shall this man be a snare unto us? Let the men go, that they may serve Yahweh their ale. Do you not yet know that Egypt is destroyed? And Moses and Aharon were brought again into Pharaoh, and he said unto them, Go and serve Yahweh your ale. Who are the ones who are going? And Moses said, We will go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, we will go, for we must hold a feast unto Yahweh. And then he said unto them, Yahweh had better be with you when you go. When I let you go and your little ones go, beware for evil is ahead of you. Not so. Go now, you who are men, and serve Yahweh, for that is what you desire. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. And then Yahweh said unto Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt to the locusts, or for the locusts, and that they may come up on the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land and all the hail that is left. And Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt, and Yahweh brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territories of Egypt, and they were very severe. Previously there had not been such locusts as they were, nor shall there be such after them. For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was darkened. And they ate up every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. So there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aharon in haste, and he said, I have sinned against Yahweh, your El, and against you. And now, therefore, please forgive my sin only this once and entreat, entreat Yahweh. Your L, that he may take away from me this death only. So he went out from Pharaoh and he entreated Yahweh. And Yahweh turned a very strong west wind, which took the locusts away and blew them into the Red Sea. And there remained not one locust in all the territory of Egypt. But Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he did not let the children of Israel. Go. That was the eighth plague we just dealt with. This is now plague number nine, verse 21 of the 10th chapter of We Elishimot called Exodus. And it reads on this wise. Then Yahweh said unto Moses, Stretch out your hand towards the heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched out his hand towards heaven. And there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. And they did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. <laughs> but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings <laughs> and said, Go serve Yahweh, only let your flock and your herd be kept back. Let your little ones also go with you. But Moses said, you must also give us sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice unto Yahweh our El. Our livestock also shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind. For we must 
take some of them to serve Yahweh Ael. And even we do not know with what we must serve Yahweh until we arrive there. But Yahweh hardened Moses, Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Take heed to yourself and see my face no more. For in the day you see my face, you shall die. And Moses said, You have spoken well. I will never see your face again. Hallelujah. And at the end of the reading of Exodus chapter 10, verse 1 through 29, we have covered Exodus 6 through 10. May Yahweh add clarity, enlightenment, and edification to the reading of his word. Hallelujah. Let's go back to what we talked about in 8, because we read all the way from 8, 9, and 10. So, when you're looking at the plagues, and you want to put the plagues, you know, make sure you know that there, beloved, make sure you know that there's 10 plagues, and make sure that you put the plagues in a chronological you know, order. The last place we left off at when we were talking, if I'm not mistaken, I believe we left off uh, enumer enumerating the seventh plague, which was the judgment of hell and fire, which was in chapter 9. And as we read forth, you get to plague 8, which was the plague of the locusts in chapter 10. And you continue to read forward. You read that there was darkness on Egypt for three days, you know, darkness that can't be felt. This was the ninth plague. And as you get up, we will then read next week as we go into the tenth plague. So now we are dealt with nine of the ten plagues. And we have rehearsed these, right? So when you look at, you know, water turned to blood and the frogs come on the land and then there's the lice and then there's the flies. And then the flies are destroyed, and the livestock are stricken. Then the boils come up. Then the judgment of hell and fire, right? So when I was talking, we were talking about this. And when you look at the signs of the times today, you want to look and see if there's a pattern and similarity to the plague that happened in Egypt and the events and the pestilence and the plagues that are happening upon the earth today. And the question would be, is that actually occurring? And the answer to that question is, for those who have eyes that can see and ears that can hear and hard to perceive, that we are, meaning the planet earth, is experiencing the plagues that fell in the days of Moses in Egypt. That's happening on planet earth, and it has been happening on planet Earth. And America itself is experiencing the worst form of natural disasters and snowstorms, hail, I'm talking about a biblical proportion that you'd have to be, with no disrespect to Ray Charles, but you'd have to be Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder not to see this happening on a biblical scale when you examine what is happening in the book. Now, let me draw something else for you real quick as we sit here and have this discussion. Um, and I want you to be, those who have it, would be able to see it um, for themselves. Others may not have it, so they may not know what we're talking about, but we are going to um, discuss the matter and see if we can draw a parallel here. Um, when we go into a document that I prepared for you. So for those who don't know, just bear with us. And it's on page 7 and page 8 of the study guide. You know, And that study guide covers 10 plagues of Egypt that go, you know, in the chapters that we just read. And we're not going to reread them again, but we read them. And you know it's enumerated from chapter 7 all the way up to chapter 12. Because chapter 12 is when we come out of the captivity in Egypt, and they've got the ten plagues, the blood, the frogs, you know, the, 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 the lice or the gnats, the flies, the livestock, the boils, the hail, the locusts, 
darkness for three days and night, and then the killing of the firstborn. Ten plagues, right? So Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, He, Wa, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yod. Ten in Hebrew, Yod, Yuit, means the hand of Yah. Ten. Ten plagues, all right? Ten of them. Now, some people, naysayers, unbelievers, and the scripture says in Psalms 14 and in Psalms 53, 1, the fool has said in his heart there is no Yah. Well, the scripture is right, and anybody that believes otherwise is just foolish and wrong. When you examine what is written in the scroll, in the text, in the, in, the, in the Exodus text, you will find a pronouncement of divine judgment on a nation that held the children of Israel in bondage. The Bible is not a religious book. The Bible, as it was taught by the elders, as it is taught by those who are led by the Spirit, understand that there's 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 writings or books in the New Testament. When we combine the book, because it's one book with many books in it, it brings you to a total of 66 books. It is a book of law. It is a book of history. It is a book of poetry and songs. It is a book of prophecy. And it is a book where letters are written in it. It is a complete, and if I combine all those works together into one, it is a profound and divine historical book. It's a historical text. The Exodus text is a record of the children of Israel coming out of slavery in Egypt. So now, we teach, because the scripture teaches us in the law, and Yeshua HaMashiach, Yahweh confirms it in the Besorah when it is mentioned or uttered by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter shall be confirmed. So I've got the Exodus text, as you do, talking about the ten plagues. So now we need to find another witness. And not that the word of Yah by itself alone couldn't stand because it does. Because when you go to Psalms 105, you get the reiteration of these events here. But now I'm going to look outside the Hebraic historical text and see if I can find another historical document that will echo the events of Exodus. The document we are talking about is called the Ipura Papyrus, I-P-U-W-E-R, known as the Ipura text of Shemot or of the Exodus. The Ipura text is the Egyptian account of an event that, or a series of events that took place in the days of the Pharaoh that we spoke about in the beginning. Pharaoh is simply a title. It's not a name. So out of the papyrus of the Apura, it reads this way. Papyrus, chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. It says, the plague is throughout all the land and blood is everywhere. That's the Egyptian historical text. Papyrus, chapter 2, verse 10 says, the river is blood. Papyrus, chapter 2, verse 10, continuing. Men shrink from tasting. They thirst after water, for they could not drink of the water of the river. Chapter 3, verse 10 and 13. That is our water. That is our happiness. What shall we do in respect thereof? All is ruin. All is ruin. That's coming from their text, from their papers. Reading a little bit forward. Chapter 4. 14. It says the trees are destroyed. Papyrus chapter 6 verse 1. No herb of the fields were found. Hmm. Chapter, Papyrus chapter 2 verse 10 says, forth shook the gates, the columns on the walls are all consumed with fire. Chapter 10 verse 3 and 6 of the same Papyrus says, Lord Egypt weeps. The entire palace is without its revenue. 
To it belong wheat, barley, geese, and fish. And the last two papyruses that I'll touch on is Papyrus 6.3 and Papyrus 5.5, which says, For Sue, the grain has perished on every side. That has perished, which yesterday was seen, the land has left over to its weariness like a cutting of the flax. Papyrus 5.5 5 says, All animals, their hearts weep, cattle mourn. This is an account of a devastating series of events that fell upon Egypt. This document, which was written during the 19th century, uh, meaning back in the day of the rather Egyptian 19th dynasty, the Middle Kingdom, was found in Egypt. This actual document is in Linden Museum in Holland. And this is called, historically, the Advanations of Egypt from Heretic Papyrus in Leden, or Ledan. And what it goes off to explain, beloved, is what we just did. It also says that Papyrus describes violent upheavals in Egypt, starvation, droughts, the escape of slaves with all the wealth of Egypt, and death throughout the entire land. The papyrus was written by an Egyptian named Ipura, or Ipura, and appears to be an eyewitness account of the very effects of the Exodus plagues with the perspective coming from an average Egyptian. And as we just read, above were excerpts from the papyrus. It's a very lengthy document. I didn't have time to put the whole document in here. But if you simply go to a, for those of us who have encyclopedias on our shelves, pull them down and look up the Apura text. For those who want to use a more modern means of research, then go to Google and Google the Apura text and read it. And you will be amazed that this historical account, see, they hid this from us. And most of the people on planet Earth don't even know this exists. This confirms the Exodus text that is written in the scriptures in the second book of the Torah. So by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter shall be confirmed. So when you look at this, this is a historical document, right? Just like what we say in the scriptures. This is not mythology. Our scriptures is not mythology. These events happen to Egypt. So when I say to you as I close on this tonight, when you see the water turn to blood, that's a sign. When you see that hail fell in Egypt and the hail was so large that it broke down the trees, that's a sign. The fact that it snowed, right? This was in Denver, Colorado in June. It rained in the morning. At 12 noon, it thunderstormed. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, two tornadoes touched down. At night, it snowed from 6 p.m. to midnight, and from 1 o'clock to 6 in the morning, hail fell the size of softballs four feet high. That's a sign. That's a sign. In the situation here with the Egyptian text, the scripture said that when the hail fell, it struck the trees, it struck the greenery, it struck the herb of the field, and it struck the animals. Take the animals and do what? Put them on the inside. But people didn't. And that which was left out in the field was struck by the hand of the Most High and was destroyed. Well, in Spain, just a month and a half ago, they had a severe hailstorm the size of softballs to where 275 flamingos were killed. But that didn't make CNN and NSNBC. But a lot of things that are used as diversionary tactics will make the news, like the upheaval that happened this past weekend. And though, if anyone lost their lives over there, because I'm a man of deep spiritual understanding, and those were souls, regardless of what one's position was, those were souls that lost their lives. So I don't judge them. But I am concerned that individual issues that affect us and our people, like the murders of the students that were in Nigeria, were not on the news and people did not fly the flags for people of melanated hue 
why people want and the media wants people to fly flags for France. When France is responsible for the turmoil and the degradation of Haiti. And the Haitians have not recovered from France and they have not recovered from that nine uh nine point one earthquake that happened years ago. But not no aid is given to them. So I want to not only share with you the double standard that's going on, but I want you to be duped by what I call the okie doke and the act and the move of distraction. Distraction is going on. Something else on earth is taking place, and all these other events, unless they're of a biblical nature, are distractions. So you be awake, be wise and sober-minded of what is going on, because those events that are happening on earth, the wars, the rumors of wars, the famines, the pestilence, the earthquakes in diverse places, the scripture says these are the beginning of birth pains. And we know when there are birth pains, something is about to be born. And that which is about to be born is the Hebrew Israelite nation. So who has heard of such a thing? Who has seen of such a thing? Should the earth bring forth or shall the nation be born at once? For when Zion travail, when Zion travail, that means you, when Zion was in tribulation, she brought forth her children. So a nation is about to be born. And you are that nation that is about to be born. And so before we close, anyone have any questions that they want to touch, raise real quick? No? All right, that's good to know. Then when One I get... question, Elder. Go ahead. This sounds like Brother Edward. Yes, yes, sir, it is. Um, thank you for the lesson. I just wanted to make a reference to something you mentioned in Exodus uh Actually, it's Exodus eight eighteen, and you mentioned that the lights were living, and it kind of it kind of goes hand in hand with uh, the Decapolis of Elijah in chapter three, verse sorry, um, yeah, verse twelve, and it says he will do works which Hamashiach did, except for raising the dead alone. Mm -hmm. Could you read that again? Yes, sir. It is in uh, the, the Apocalypse of Elijah, chapter 3, verse 12. He will do works which Hamashiach did, except for raising the dead alone. Right. And, and you had mentioned these were living creatures, living beings, life that he made from dust. Right. This is, the, I guess, this is the, the one vice that the, the enemy cannot conquer or get over and Absolutely. creating life. Absolutely. Now, okay. I just want, okay. just want to no, no, I no, no, you did, you did excellent as a, as a, as a great intro uh, and a lead into the Shabbat Seder. And so if you would be so kind to reiterate, please, uh, perhaps just a little bit slower. So everyone who did not hear you or could not hear you, could you tell them where you're quoting from? What book? And then what chapter and what verse? And then we'll elaborate on this before we close. Sure. I'm um, actually quoting from the, the Apocalypse of Elijah or Elijah. Right. I am speaking directly from chapter 3, verse 12. Right. Okay. So now out of the pseudepigrapher and out of the book of the Apocalypse. So this book that our brother is referring to is an apocalyptic book. It's very similar to the book of Revelation, meaning that it is an end time or a book that deals primarily with end time events. And so what our brother is referring to, and it's very important, when we're talking about the magicians mimicking the miracles or the signs that Moses was performing, they stopped that mimic when the miracle that Moses performed through the hand of Yah brought forth life in the form of the of the life. As you read the scriptures where he just came from, it said, and the Egyptians tried, but they could not do what? They could not perform that. That's what we were reading from. And that's out of verse 18 of the eighth chapter. Now the magicians so worked with their enchantments to bring forth life, life, but they could not. So there were lice on men and on beasts. And so they're not able, witches and warlocks and soothsayers and divinators 
You know, magicians are not able to bring forth real life from anything. So the anti-Messiah, and this is where the book of Elijah comes in, the book of Eliyahu gives you the description of the end times anti-Messianic counterfeit Messiah. All right? And it's in the third chapter, just as he said. And in verse 1 calls him the son of lawlessness or the lawless one. And from that verse all the way through, it breaks down the works of the Antichrist all the way through the description of the Antichrist and what he is not able to perform. And what he is not able to perform, as I will read here again, and that means that when you read in the Revelation chapter 13, right, the scripture warns you about the false prophet being able to do what? Call down fire from where? Heaven in the sight of men. And this is what Yahshua taught us in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. He said, and they will perform false prophets and false Christ will perform signs and lying what? Wonders that if it were possible to deceive the very elect. But you're not going to be deceived. And in this third chapter of the book of the Apocalypse of Elijah, it says that the anti-Messiah will multiply his signs and wonders in the presence of anyone, everyone. He will do the works which Hamashiach did, except for raising the dead alone. In this, you will know that he is the son of lawlessness because he is unable to give life. And then for the sake of brevity, you know, you need to read verse 15, 16, and 17 because it gives you the actual description of the anti-Messiah. So, and we will be touching on that as we get into the books of Daniel and into the books of Revelation. Uh, we will tie this into the apocalypse of Abraham. Uh, for those who haven't read it or read it, read it. Um, all these are profound and timely end times messianic books and apocalyptic books. There's also another apocalyptic book of Daniel that we will get into. So if there is no other question, that means that everybody is going to get an A. And I haven't put up uh, any individual's uh, scores. Uh, some people have received emails from me. If you want a copy of your current uh, score, then go ahead and email me or email Zamira, and, and we'll send it uh, to you. Overall, the class is doing well. You, you had a 94.5 average. Um, we've got a few that are up at the 97 and 99 percentile. Again, it is not just about the test score, beloved. It is about your ability to retain these scriptures and, more importantly, your ability to practice that which you have read and employ it into your lives. So, the uh, test questions or quizzes from Genesis chapter 20 through chapter 50 are all out there online on quizstar.com. And sun, Sunday night, Yom Rishon, uh, Exodus chapter 1 through 5 will be out there also. So if there's no other questions, then let us all turn towards Jerusalem and close ourselves out as we make our exit before the Most High. Let's bow our heads and humble our spirits as we pray before Yah. I would truly I give thanks unto thee for this evening and for this gathering. And I thank you for all the saints of the Most High who have assembled. And we thank you, Abba, for pouring out your spirit upon us and being with us and guiding us and leading us. And so we ask you, Father, to give unto your people a good teaching spirit and that you would Walk with us and be our light and our eyes before us in the way that which we must go. Watch over your people wherever they are scattered at throughout the lands of the great captivity. Send your angel of your divine presence and protection around them to prepare the way in which we must go. And bring us even your people into the bond of thy covenant. So now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be eternally acceptable in thy sight, y'all. For you are our strength and our redeemer and Yeshua. Hamashiach in Yahweh Shai's name for the glory of Yahweh the Father. Let all of Israel who love, worship, and praise Yahweh alone say hallelujah. 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 H
We look forward to fellowshipping with you on the Shabbat Yom at 12 noon Central Standard Time. May Yah bless you and keep you. Lila Tov, good evening and shalom, shalom. 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 Yeah.